briefly enough some some of the issues that uh, are occurring in a, a post-traumatic stress response which um, doesn't stop in the night basically that would be one of the, the take home messages I mean, we all know that uh, nightmares and insomnia are pretty much a core part of the diagnosis of uh, uh, PTSD and that's um, they're also very prevalent so for instance in PTSD patients around 50 to 70 percent report very frequent and uh, very disturbing nightmares this can be up to 95 percent if the traumatic exposure was of a personalized violence nature and if it was repetitive um, they are part of the cluster B, um, like uh, uh, part of the diagnosis, but spread out throughout the clusters. You also have, for instance, in the hyperarousal cluster, uh, insomnia, which is also a very frequent and also a, a rather disturbing symptom. Um, I mean, of course, here, if, if you look at it like this, it's, that's pretty central. And, and uh, some psychiatrists 30 years ago from uh, uh, the US have uh, claimed that, okay, maybe these sleep disturbances are a hallmark of PTSD, which has been often quoted. So it was Ross that claimed it. Um, but the evidence is a bit mixed, especially because the objective sleep, if you measure this in the sleep laboratory, and we've all done a couple of studies on this, and Eric and Saskia van Lint have also, um, you actually see that, okay, the moment uh, PTSD patients who report heavily disrupted sleep, Sleep in the sleep lab, it seems to be going pretty pretty okay. So they they seem to be falling asleep in a decent amount of time. They go through light sleep stage one. Uh, they they have their deep sleep, slow wave sleep, in which you have these slow oscillations or delta waves. And then they come back into REM sleep, where you have very irregular, quick uh, brain waves, almost like in wakefulness. And if you uh, awaken people from this stage around. 80% can uh, report a dream, very vivid dream, very um, yeah, it's a visual dream. So in single studies, there's not such a clear cut difference. We're not, you're not looking at, uh, say, the sleep of uh, sleep apnea patients. And uh, the question is, okay, what is it then if we summarize these effects? And um, a couple of uh, authors have done this, Kobayashi in 2007, uh, also more recent ones of uh, Wang, and uh, they said, okay, let's control for some of the confounding factors because many Vietnam veterans have been studied and many uh, young uh, female patients who are assault survivors. And if you control for these kinds of factors like age and gender, substance abuse also, which is very frequent in older age uh, PTSD, uh, one of the, the things that was popping up was, okay, this slow wave sleep in Kobayashi's meta-analysis, that was a pretty solid effect small to moderate, uh, also more light sleep, and um, the REM sleep was not so much longer or shorter, but there were more eye movements, meaning it was a bit more intense, and that the dreaming was probably more intense. And then the meta-analysis of uh, Zan uh, showed also this reduced slow sleep, also reduced total sleep, more wake after sleep onset, which is a, a insomnia characteristic. What you get then is, um, if you average that and try to visualize it, it's a kind of a, a pattern of sleep fragmentation, where there's much less slow wave sleep. Uh, REM sleep is maybe a bit fragmented, definitely more intense, and there's more wake after sleep onset. And this night would be a pretty good night if somebody is suffering from uh, hyperaroused sleep and, uh, and insomnia. Now, <clears throat> this slow wave sleep is just analyzed in 30 second epochs, just as it was done when the first EEGs were invented in the 30s. So there was a printout, a paper, and the coder said, ah, this is REM sleep. And then the next 30 seconds came, okay, this is non-REM sleep stage two. You can also analyze the power of these delta waves and do it with a, a spectral analysis. So what you get is the, the very um, quick changes in, in the power. And what um, the Boer from uh, Talamini's group at, uh, at, in Amsterdam showed was that, especially in these lowest frequencies, so below one hertz, that uh, there was a reduction in PTSD patients compared to uh, trauma controls who were uh, at center 45 in uh, the Netherlands. And also uh, one at all from Anjumei's group noticed, okay, the PTSD patients seem to be having um, much less 
of delta power and the, the red uh, dots and arrow bars in both nights and they have much higher uh, powers in the higher frequencies, so in the gamma and in the beta, this is like above 20, 30, 40 hertz. And we have analyzed uh, something similar, uh, but then in people with frequent nightmares who had had a, um, a potentially traumatic event longer than five years ago, and there we could also see a similar uh, pattern. And that was uh, Bori Blaskovic, who was uh, a postdoc in the group together with uh, uh, Peter Seymour. They uh, were able to show that, okay, in people who have nightmares, uh, frequent nightmares, and have experienced such a traumatic event, it was more like incomplete PTSD, there's a tendency across all of the channels to have much of this higher frequency and much less of this lower frequency with the, the slow power, which is very important for many critical functions of sleep. So what does that all mean? Now, if you look at how the brain is normally functioning, so during the day, it's something that we call a power spectrum. And it means in our brain, there's a lot of power in the very slow frequencies, the delta, and there's much less power in the higher frequencies. This is typically in a log-log plot shown like this. You can see here some nice uh, spindle uh, events on really uh, quick waves in sleep. And these are different electrodes. And you can you know, like, uh, readjust it. But what seems to be happening in the sleep of PTSD patients is that there are these reduced low uh, frequencies and increased high frequencies in the EEG. And that it seems to be subjectively or phenomenologically um, an intrusion of wakefulness throughout sleep. So it's just simply a brain that cannot rest, cannot put itself to, to sleep. So this is really tipping the balance, this, this hyper aroused brain. And the question is, okay, why? Why is that the case? And there's many uh, neurotransmitter systems that could be involved, but one that is of particular interest is the neuroadrenergic system with the locus ceruleus as the main uh, output center. It's just one tiny blue nucleus in the brainstem, but it's uh, the, the main neuroadrenergic output center of the whole brain. And it happens to reach its uh, nadir, its minimum in REM sleep. And already in sleep, it's going down very much. So that is really a unique state because you pretty much have no, um, like no other neurotic output from that center. Um, and um, one of the, the ideas is that, okay, if these neuroadrenergic levels are too high, it remains active and you will have fragmented REM sleep and you will have much less of this deep sleep where you're very, like, where it's difficult to awaken you. And interestingly, also prazosin, which is often used against post traumatic nightmares, is like an antagonist of this neuroadrenergic uh, center. Um, and interestingly enough, if you make a, a lesion there, um, in cats, then they start to act out their dreams. They are hunting imaginary mice. And this is something that comes close to the most extreme cases in reported in, uh, in veterans who have REM sleep behavior disorder. They don't have the flat EMG line, which you can see here. And the EMG normally on the cheek is um, like, there's, there's a lot of tension during the day. It's much less in non-REM sleep. And the moment you come in REM sleep, it's a flat line. The moment you have some activity here, people start acting out their dreams and uh, vocalizing. And that's, a, that's an, interesting, um, an interesting aspect of this. Um, and that's something that uh, we may even discuss later. Why is it like this? Um, I'll, I'll get back to that in a, in a, a little while. So this, this is all part of the neuroanalytic hypothesis of the hyper brain. You have two, uh, either a normal, um, normal levels of noradrenaline that are binding to the alpha 2a receptor which is inhibitory and in the end you'll have like you know the prefrontal cortex functioning well the amygdala is dampened by the prefrontal cortex and that's the, the alert brain the, the normal rested brain and under stress you have higher levels of this neuroadrenergic output center what happens is it binds to alpha 1 which is high affinity and as a, a consequence you have a lot of activity in these emotional subcortical regions, but not necessarily in the prefrontal cortex at them. So it's pretty much uh, like a, a hypothesis of the hyper aroused brain, which is not suddenly 
completely fine in sleep. So it's hyperarousal during the day, hyperarousal in sleep. And that's what you, what you uh, happen to see also in these uh, sleep lab studies, because we've also done met, uh, many of these uh, measurements. And what people then say is simply, if you see patients who have slept with uh, many nightmares in the clinic, and then suddenly they have EEG on their head, and they know that the professional is watching, they're like, ah, OK, now I'm safe. The threat is gone, and they have a good night. And then we conclude, ah, there are not so many differences between PTSD patients and uh, case controls. Um, or controls, sorry. Also, the nightmare incidence is rather low. It's like 1% to 10%, and the normal night is much higher for PTSD patients. We've also once uh, checked this in, in some old data at uh, Center 45, where I did my, my internship uh, 20 years ago already. And there we, we saw that the same people who normally had a lot of um, post-traumatic nightmares, replicative nightmares, when they were assessing this with diaries, suddenly the moment they had EEG on for one night, they didn't have it anymore. They had less, like only one subject out of 12 had one nightmare. That's it. They were all asking if they could sleep longer with it. Kind of self-therapy. <clears throat> so what we're doing now at the Institute is uh, having had that EEG and assessing people for five to seven nights, also with wristwatch uh, watches that have uh, pulse batismography, so like heart rate uh, measurements, uh, in order to see, okay, what happens after three nights and four nights? People get used to it, and then they start to have insomnia again, and then they start to have these events in REM sleep, um, which is basically like um, a question about uh, sleep biomarkers in psychiatry, and how can we like, really implement them, and how can we select patients for some treatment uh, modules, and how can we track if they are effective. But this is maybe like the question, why is it like this? And you can imagine that although it's really annoying to have this hyper-aroused, fragmented sleep, if you are still on the threat, it is also highly adaptive that you're quickly awake. And the moment your apartment comes crashing down, that you get out. So it's basically, um, it, it is sometimes seen as an evolutionary like, function that is uh, simply the moment there's a threat, you don't sleep so soundly. And the ones that do, they, their, their chances over tens of thousands of years will reduce uh, slightly. So that's, uh, um, that's maybe something for the, the, the threat context to, to realize that hyperarousal can be highly adaptive. Now, of course, the question is a bit, if you look at uh, the, the clinical relevance, what, what kind of nightmares do we have and how does it, how do the patients experience this? Uh, because you can talk a lot about uh, EEG and we are really hoping to find something with the headband EEG because people can sleep at home and it's very light and user friendly. But what um, PTSD patients who have sometimes had uh, PTSD and in center 45, it was over 40 or 50 years, uh, what they complain the most about are these uh, replicative post-traumatic nightmares. Now you have replicative nightmares in which the trauma is really re-experienced, like literally, and you have more trauma-related in which the, um, some, some symbolic stimuli or uh, a threat context is kind of uh, provided in the dream. But it's still a clear links to the traumatic event. And many, many things are mixed. So you can have a, like a replication and then suddenly there are some unusual things happening. Also with idiopathic nightmares, they can cause high distress, by the way. Idiopathic nightmares are non-trauma related. And many people with PTSD that have replicative nightmares also have other sorts of nightmares, which are more idiopathic and which are very um, excellent to begin like nightmare treatment with, by the way, because it's, um, they are occurring quite frequently and they have more broader teams like being chased. And um, you, you don't immediately have to go for the encapsulated memory of the traumatic event. What happens then if you um, like wake up and you just literally re-experience your traumatic event? So it's, it's not that you knew that it was that you were dreaming, you were there, and you didn't know you were dreaming. Is that, of course, you know, you, you develop insomnia uh, symptoms in the sense that you will sit on the lights, get out of bed, drink some milk, calm down, maybe drink a book, uh, read a book, uh, drink something more, who knows? Some people also develop a fear of sleep. So you can imagine how some sleep with the lights on, um, some sleep in separate beds, how sleep becomes a very big topic and how 
many of these physiological things um, become more behaviorally maintained over the months and, and years. And um, if you then check, okay, yeah, but, but how frequent is it? And I think it, it's safe to say that nightmares are a pretty normal response to uh, extreme events. So that it, it's, it's pretty common. So for instance, in uh, kids in the Gaza Strip that experienced a couple of uh, wars and on average had several uh, traumatic events that they directly witnessed, um, more than half had nightmares and 40% in the end had a, a high like nightmare frequency, meaning several times um, a week. And these were young kids, 10 to 12 uh, year olds, which is also going to be probably very relevant for the refugees um, uh, that are uh, coming to, uh, to other European countries. Uh, they will probably also have a lot of those nightmares and I mean, that's logical and not necessarily uh, problematic. These kids were dreaming a lot about um, violent settings, uh, scenes of death, um, uh, particularly the life threat to the dreamer. It was, was very um, frequent. Um, but of course, there are a lot of surreal and unreal dream elements, and there are some authors that are saying that this is the, um, the therapeutic work being done in REM sleep. That's the moment you have this encapsulated memory and it's being bombarded in REM sleep with all these weird stimuli that you would never expect to be there, that um, the, the mental groove is just getting a bit opener and eroding a bit and connecting to other networks and hopefully at some point uh, becoming a, a regular like, um, memory. But that's, that's just uh, one theory. There's very little data on that. And it's not just that it's like a consequence of a traumatic event. Um, Saskia Williams and Eve Meta have also provided data that show that actually nightmare, having nightmares before deployment in soldiers was uh, one of the predictors of um, later uh, PTSD symptom development, and especially having a very high score, which you can see here, also ratio of around three. And um, as far as I know, next to anxiety pre-deployment, the only uh, significant predictor of later PTSD uh, development. So that's a pretty relevant thing that we, we have pretty easy access to. You just have to ask, and how's your sleep? Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. And nightmares? But people, people tell that much easier than, okay, I'm feeling so depressed. It's, it's a very, um, almost a somatic symptom to, to discuss. And um, it's important to realize that they're, like nightmares are not a sign of a chronic complex uh, PTSD response. They're part of a normal post-traumatic stress response. But just if you look at the, um, the national prevalence data in the, in the US, and you see, okay, of all the people that were trauma exposed, some developed PTSD and have a diagnosis. It's, it's, it's not so much that they have nightmares more or differently or insomnia, yeah, maybe a bit more, but the, the issue is really that they seem to be having insomnia and nightmares at the same time, quite a bit, uh, 56% versus 30% of the just trauma exposed who don't have PTSD. So that means these nightmares are simply so intense that there's no way that you're going to sleep afterwards anytime soon. It's going to, it's going to last a little while. Um, but still, by the way, the people that have it, uh, if, you, if you look at the whole population, most of the people that have it, uh, of the 366 plus 157, like only a third has then PTSD. The rest still would, would not have PTSD and would still be in the the non-clinical uh, realm. Um, but particularly these uh, post-traumatic uh, replicative nightmares um, are related to the highest symptom scores of the B cluster, C, D, uh, SEL total scores. Uh, and also uh, hyper arousal is uh, much more improved compared to people who only have like trauma associated or more symbolic dreams versus people who don't have this. And these are all PTSD patients um, that had the same nightmares 40 years after being in a, a Japanese prisoner camp. Um, the study from uh, Schroeder, maybe you still know him, uh, Erik. 
possible oh. set for the time. I'm sitting on a question or maybe a few questions, but I don't want to interrupt you. I don't know how much time you would like to have before you. Um, I think I'm, I'm almost done, actually. Okay. Uh, maybe a couple of um, okay. more slides and then we can wrap it up. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so what is good to know is that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is effective, especially in measure your rehearsal has shown good effects on the amount of nights with nightmares a week, nightmares per week, and also post-traumatic stress in general. You write down the recurrent nightmare, you change the ending and imagine this ending. Of course, uh, there are six sessions for this and there are several steps that you have to do before that. In PTSD, it's recommended not to start with the worst nightmare, but just for one that they can succeed. Uh, and it's very well combinable with uh, insomnia, especially sleep hygiene, stimulus control, how you have to get off the bed when you're awake. Uh, versus uh, sleep restriction. You really have to keep your sleep efficiency high and sometimes only be five hours in the bed. And this has now also been shown in uh, meta-analysis. This is a meta-analysis that uh, Jaap Lancé uh, has done. Um, and they've shown, okay, imaginary rehearsal seems to be having pretty decent effect on nightmare frequency, but also on uh, PTSD. And with praises in, even though the largest study did not show such great effect by Reskin at all, there still seem to be overall pretty decent effects for the praises in as well. And especially interesting is that uh, the reports of uh, dream mastery, people being able to master this uncontrollable symptom um, was, was helpful and re reported to be very helpful for that. So the question is really, okay, so what should we do? And it's, it depends a bit from which perspective you come. If you come from the perspective, okay, I have a PTSD patient sitting here in front of me, or if you're uh, checking a pop doing a population study of uh, people that, uh, that fled. Uh, in the end, these symptoms could be more than just, you know, secondary symptoms in the PTSD diagnosis. They could be separate disorders that develop in response to a traumatic event, which is, uh, has sometimes been referred to as uh, trauma-associated sleep disorder. They could exacerbate uh, PTSD by, if you really sleep badly, we all know how emotional you are the next day and how you cannot deal with the things you can normally deal with. Or there can be a risk factor, right, like nightmares or maybe also uh, sleep apnea, periodic limb movements before your traumatic event. So maybe uh, just as a, a general thing, um, interesting enough, insomnia is uh, typically a, a very uh, frequent residual symptom after PTSD treatment, and nightmares are by themselves correlated to both cumulative trauma exposure, so maybe an indicator of that, and uh, suicidal behavior when you control it for PTSD and um, uh, cumulative trauma exposure. Yeah, exactly. With this, I would like to thank my, uh, my group, um, you for the attention. I have some uh, disclosure to make that I did some uh, consulting activities for Roche. I thought, um, and, uh, yeah. uh, for the sake of honesty, let's show that also. Absolutely. And yeah, that's, that, was, that was it. So Absolutely. thanks a lot for your attention. Thank, thank you so much, Victor. And you can, you can tell, and Victor is the expert on sleep. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have a, a proposal. Uh, let me just do this here. Um, I make. I, I first have a question to your excellent overview of, of sleep um, and, and the brain, uh, Victor, but I may call on three people as a chair. Maybe I don't want to put you on the spot, but maybe Natalia, Natalia Sobolevska or, um, or maybe Olena Zabenko or maybe um, somebody else could bring a table or maybe Bob Persano from Washington who is with us. But let me first ask you a question, Victor, myself. Like you showed or you talked about the hyper aroused brain in sleep. And um, we're very aware in combat stress situations like many people are now in Ukraine, typically they would like to get some sleep and to get some safety. And a sort of a no brainer is that alcohol may in the minds of, of many people be uh, comfortable to get some sleep. What is the effect of alcohol use or alcohol intake on this hyper aroused brain? Is there any information that you could share with us? Um, yeah, I mean, what, what is known about alcohol intake is that simply you tend to fall asleep easier. So your sleep onset latency is one variable really reduces. But then afterwards, uh, the sleep is less deep and it's more fragmented and you wake up 
sooner. So in a way, it's it's not really helpful to to counterbalance this um, hyper arousal states, although it's a very understandable form of self medication that could actually exacerbate uh, matters. Okay, so stay away from alcohol is your advice, even though. You yeah, it depends really on the on the amounts. If you have, I don't know, like a, a drink to, to help you fall asleep and you're not waking up afterwards and you don't lie awake for an hour, then that's maybe the amount that, that, that should work. But in general, yeah, it's uh, um, the effects are, are not necessarily positive on, on sleep. So it's, it won't counteract this, uh, this hyper arousal uh, vicious circle that you're in. What Irina shared with us last week or the week before was that uh, alcohol was pretty much banned in the shelters. Because uh, because of safety regulation and the fact that there's not many many drunk people now in the shelters anymore, so I think that's that's a, that's a very good thing. Now, any of the three people that I called, would you have a question for Victor, maybe, or let's open it up briefly for for discussion. Anybody who has, or maybe yes. Bob, if you're with us, or any of the other two that would like to ask to Victor, yes, just say, say say your name. Victor, can you please stop attention? sharing slides, please? Yeah, please stop sharing slides. Yes, yes, yes absolutely, absolutely. Yes, go ahead. My name is Olena Jabenko, and I know from my, I have been working with uh, Irina and uh, Lesa in Kiev until 2014. And I know that uh, alcohol is no, not available in Kiev now. Um, across 12 studies, we know that um, insomnia is prevalent in alcohol dependent patients from 36 to 91%. We know that uh, among alcohol dependent patients, um, and alcohol consume is predictor of insomnia, and this effect is mediated by depression and psychiatric effect. And my question is, uh, thank you very much for your fantastic presentation. And my, um, uh, my question is, do we need to treat also post-traumatic stress disorder, psychotherapeutic or parallel to uh, imagery rehearsal therapy? Thank or you. do we need to, to make it separately? Excellent question. Could you be briefly answering to that brief Victor? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, a very good question. The evidence is uh, suggesting that exactly starting with this or doing this in the beginning could be um, very motivational for patients also. So that's um, it, it actually shows them you can gain some control over your uh, your nightmares and most manage. So like 70, 75 percent. And it's especially the ones that have uh, repetitive nightmares, where you know, like having the, the your typical trauma therapy, and at the same time addressing three sessions or six sessions to imaginary rehearsal and maybe insomnia. I think it would be very beneficial if you look at the evidence. So most studies show this. Thank you. Now maybe I see you on the spot. Victor raised his. Uh, sorry, Victor, you are with us. Uh, Bob Persano raised his hand, and then we have a, a question also from Marit Brandi and Ulrike Schmidt. Uh, Bob, can I give the word to you? Yeah, just a quick comment, Victor. Wonderful presentation. I missed the opening, so my question might be contained in that. I love the path diagrams at the end uh, because clearly all of those must be true, and the question is distinguishing which people have which paths of the relationship of sleep to their PTSD. Um, we have one study in Army, we have a number of studies in Army STARS related to sleep, but one in particular that looked pre-post deployment uh, and very nicely done that did support the idea that insomnia prior to uh, deployment and trauma exposure increased risk for PTSD, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you have some thoughts on um, both nightmare deconstruction itself as a treatment and it's, in other words, focus on the nightmares, deal with it and see if PTSD changes. And then also, if you had any thoughts on pharmacologic management of sleep in, in a company to PTSD, and you okay. may have already discussed these, and if so, feel free to ignore them. And I'll ask Eric to educate me afterwards. <laughs> for sure, I'd love to do that. If I can have an opportunity ever to educate you <laughs> to die for. Victor, briefly, please. Yeah, yeah, so the, the deconstruction is uh, particularly relevant, although the effects of exposure therapy, like plain exposure, are pretty uh, com comparative to uh, imaginary rehearsal where you change the ending and imagine it. It's just um, people with nightmares really hate it. They hate the thinking about their nightmare and then in the same manner and then over and over again. You can imagine 
if you do this, if it's a post-traumatic nightmare, not a chance that people will do this. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's that's one of the advantages of imagine rehearsal where you can make a, a positive swing or something like just something else. It doesn't matter, even as tiny as a detail. And then the problem is, okay, how, like that's that's what many patients also say, like, yeah, but this is how it really happened. So, you know, like my husband died. Uh, I, can, I cannot change that. And now what is happening in uh, psychotherapy is that uh, a new um, treatment that's, that's gaining more traction is this uh, rescripting therapy, where it, the answer is then to this question, yeah, that might be true. Um, but if you would imagine what would you need at that time, what would be helpful at that time, or what would you like to change? And, and I think either doing it in a nightmare and maybe not the worst nightmare or during the day would have similar um, effects on the encapsulated memory probably. And with your uh, question about uh, the um, pharmacological interactions, I think the evidence now is pointing mostly towards prazosine, even though the last um, multi-site RCT by Reshkind was not so uh, so positive. On average, the meta meta analyses are still showing a positive effect. Thank you for saying that. Now, Thanks. Uh, thank you um, um, for asking that, Bob. Uh, two minutes, and then I don't want to do injustice to Katerina Melamot, who is with us from Kharkiv, and to bring her to the floor as well. But I have one hand from Ulrike and one from Marit, who Marit is with us. Could you could you phrase your question, Marit, if you wanted to go to the microphone? But then let's let's be really brief, but I want to give echo to the, the question that Marit has. Marit? Are yes. you, you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so it's very Short question, indeed. Um, it's about, uh, well, you, you mentioned that the hyper-aroused brain, uh, so people under current stress or threat, aren't able to relax or to get to sleep. From an evolutionary perspective, that is an adaptive uh, response. But uh, that if it's very prolonged, as it's actually now, that can also be very problematic for people. So what would you then recommend from a public health perspective to people who want to do something about it, right? Because we don't know, we cannot prescribe benzodiazepines. What would you recommend? Great question. Medication or, or psychotherapy. I mean, some sort of uh, stress management at some point will be necessary. I, I agree with you on that because you cannot live, uh, have like six um, weeks without, without sleep. Fortunately, it will also come back. So you will have rebound effects if you just have too much of uh, sleep deprivation. Uh, some probably some uh, very basic uh, insomnia, sleep hygiene, and uh, stimulus control interactions would be the easiest and the, and the lightest uh, to start with to keep keep some sort of balance over that. And it really depends on how the threat is. So if the if the the, the incidence or if the probability is is really low and um, there's there's no I don't know how, how to say it, barbarians at the gate then, you know, it's it's a different uh, situation. Okay, if yeah. you can really be brief, sorry, I have to cut it short, Marit. Um, uh, Uli, if you can really- brief, Yes, brief. very, yeah, Thank very you. brief, just a comment. Um, fantastic presentation, Victor. My comment is, yeah. since years, um, um, prasazine is unavailable in Germany and in Austria. I don't know how it is in other um, European and non-European countries. And therefore I recommend in, for those countries um, in which prasazine is not available anymore, doxazine, which is a very similar substance. And yeah, this is just what I wanted to mention and it works uh, quite well and it has a very similar mechanism of action. Thank you for saying that. For yeah, that thanks for that. Sir. Yeah, of course, that makes a lot of sense. Hey, um, uh, I have to consult briefly with Irina. Irina, when we do this next time, we need to plan it a little bit longer because we see <laughs> that it's so exciting. It's already a quarter to the hour and we haven't even heard from um, uh, Katharina Melamut. So if you want to stay with us, we may go over the top of the hour a little bit. That happened last times as well with us. So if you have to leave then, Okay, we, we, we respect that, but we will go over our because we wanted to give credit to the, to the important uh, message that um, Katerina Melamut is asking from us. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Victor, and thank you, thank you for, the, for, the, for the attendees and Bob and Marit and uh, Ulrike 
um, and um, I'm forgetting your name for, uh, oh, Lena, yes, for asking these uh, brilliant questions. And without further ado, will you, Irina, then um, invite Katerina to the floor, please? Uh, yes, be before I will do that, I have two comments. Uh, Ulrike, could, could you please write down the name of this uh, medication to the chat? And right now I will put uh, the link to uh, Google Doc. So Victor has provided us a guideline on how to deal with nightmares that includes recommendation based on this uh, rehearsal imaginary uh, therapy. And we were able to translate it already into Ukrainian, and this is a self-guide, so you can either do it by yourself or do it with your patients. However, it includes recommendations that um, you shouldn't do it uh, too quick and too early, you, you, uh, like a, a patients need to be in safety, of course, before you start working with nightmares. And as we heard, this is like a normal reaction to a normal situation. And uh, may I share uh, my screen, please? I will share uh, slides uh, uh, instead of uh, on behalf of Ekaterina. Yeah, you uh, can share, Irina. Yes, and uh, Ekaterina is a, a colleague of mine from uh, Kharkiv, Ukraine. She is a psychiatrist and as well psychotherapist. Uh, and she works at the psychoneurological dispensary number three, which is an outpatient clinic in Kharkiv, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, just, just to uh, show participants where Kharkiv is, so it's next to the border with, with, uh, with Russia, and it was under a heavy attacks uh, during the first weeks after war has started. And uh, uh, Katerina will present briefly a current situation um, in, in her city with the outpatient service, and then she will proceed to a clinical case. Please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to present my clinical case and tell you a little bit about the situation in Ukraine and situation in Kharkiv, because right now it's really hot, hot place. and. So we do all the best to provide the medical services for our mental patient. And sometimes it's really hard because we don't have uh, the medication. We don't have people or volunteers who can uh, get the medication from the hospital and to deliver the medication to the patient. And it's a little bit complicated. But the last weeks, the situation becomes uh, become better, became better. And... Um, uh, our institution uh, decided to uh, start the work and uh, uh, we, we opened and uh, about 10% of our to provide some, some care and to, to accept uh, our patients to disturb the humanitarian drugs uh, and uh, we uh, provide some acute care to patient with their acute mental symptoms or to patient who is in the psychotic state right now. Uh, we have, uh, we actually, we have a lot of reactive psychosis right now in Kharkiv. Some of them, they are admitted to a mental hospital. Some, some of them, they can come to our institution. And also we are trying to get our patients some kind of papers and certificates for a military services because some of our patients wants to go outside from the country and they cannot go without these documents and without this paper. Uh, Actually, in mental hospital, the situation is a little bit different than in our institution. So in our, in our city, it's uh, one and a half million people. It's a big city. And we have just one dispensary, uh, outpatient uh, center, and we have inpatient center. So in inpatient center, the situation is a little bit different because people uh, who work there, they cannot go out. So most of, most of the doctors live with the families in hospital um, next to, with uh, their patients. And uh, we have right now a lot of patients with uh, 
uh, exacerbation of psychotic states and with the reactive psychosis also. So most of the patients who were sitting in the um, shed, uh, shelters and uh, on subways, they also affected uh, with the different uh, types of, uh, of psychosis. And uh, I want to present you a clinical case. It's a case uh, of, uh, of my patient. She is also, right now she's in Kharkiv. Uh, but she's from from South Africa. It's uh, just uh, they are part of uh, of my city, and uh, the Russian army bombed South Africa too much, and uh, she have lost she has lost her home. Uh, her house uh, burned down, and uh, my patient her. She's uh, really nice, uh, 42 years old, and she's a um, PhD. Uh, she's a, she has a higher education. She's married, and uh, she's a mom of a five-year daughter. Uh, she uh, doesn't work uh, because of her mental state for uh, a long time. And like a person... Uh, She's a calm, she's a calm, kind, caring, and too much, even too much worried about the other people, about their feeling. And I feel her like uh, she has a big masochistic part of, of her character. Uh, and uh, a little bit about her story, about her anamnesis. Uh, her mood uh, changed uh, from the adolescent age and uh, she felt symptoms of depression and panic attack uh, since uh, 14 or 15 years old. Uh, at the age of 18, she had, she had suicidal attempt because of uh, relationship. It was overdosage of, a tranquil of a tranquilizers. And uh, after this, she uh, she began to restrict her food and she gets uh, some anorexia and after this compulsive overeating until the age of uh, 27 or 28. And uh, from uh, since the age of 20 years, she has been taking um, a lot of different types of uh, tranquilizer and anti antidepressive drug, uh, but uh, without uh, any... Um, uh, without any any good and stable effect so she changed from one type to another type but without uh, good effect and she had an episode uh, she was sexually abused uh, several times in her life and because of this i think that she has she doesn't have uh, uh, the signed diagnosis of ptsd but i think that she has uh, some ptsd because of also because of her nightmares and uh, repetitive nightmares and uh, some symptoms of intrusion. And uh, I feel her like a, a borderline patient. She's functioning on a borderline level. And uh, because uh, she has some, some episodes of sexual abuse and she, she has some episode of emotional violence in her family. Uh, from her mom and from her dad and uh, she was uh, admitted to the mental hospital about three or four times uh, because of some different situations and because of, because of acute emotional breakdowns related to some situation related to some psychological trauma and um, in uh, 2005 and 2007 she was admitted and she was diagnosed with a somatoform uh, autonomic dysfunction and uh, personality accentuation. Uh, when uh, she became my patient in uh, uh, 2019, uh, I decided that uh, she, have, she had a borderline personality disorder. And uh, at the same time, she was 
too much depressed and she had too much somatic symptoms uh, uh, and nightmares and different uh, different uh, unpleasant feelings, uh, panic attacks and so on. And uh, she was diagnosed also with a depressive episode of uh, moderate severity with a somatic syndrome. Uh, before uh, she came to our institution, she used a lot of uh, a lot of medication, and without any good effects. And she was prescri prescribing with the SSRI, with uh, Ciprolex, Escitalopram and pregabalin, but with a small response. I also advised her to go to the, uh, to get psychotherapy, but uh, she told me that she um, don't want, she uh, doesn't have her money. She doesn't want, she doesn't have her money for, for psychotherapy. And uh, she, uh, she believed that uh, her symptoms mostly connected with some organic pathology but not to be not with their psychological situation, not with her husband. And uh, right now, uh, she has been treating with a different type of drugs, but without good effects. And right now, she gets agomelatine, twenty-five milligrams, clonazepam. It's a tranquilizer, two milligram twice a day. And from time to time, she gets uh, occasionally pregabalin um 150 to 300 milligrams per day but uh during all of her life uh depends on her emotional state and depends on different types of situation she gets some specific uh, attacks or some seizures uh it's a, a big question what is it uh because uh, from time to time she is she still be uh in conscious but sometimes she's unconscious. With the war, with the beginning of the war, uh, these attacks or episodes uh, is every day. But right now in Kharkiv, clonazepam is, um, it's not available. And uh, maybe it's just because of uh, decreasing dosage of clonazepam, or maybe we have uh, different other reasons we don't know. And right now she told me that she feels a lot of uh, nightmares every, every day, every night, and uh, she can't sleep well. And uh, we just have, she, she just, she has agomelatin uh, and uh, pregabalin and uh, that's it. We don't have any tranquilizers to give her. And uh, it's interesting for me to know what should I do? How can I help? and maybe we can prescribe or can we prescribe some different medication to help her to have some questions to Ekaterina maybe some additional information you would like to hear or maybe you have um, uh, some ideas I have I have, I have I have a lot of additional information but actually you go ahead it's a time limit go ahead no go ahead we wanted to we are okay in going over the clock a little bit so let's let's go ten minutes over the top of the hour. Mm -hmm. Then we have time to discuss time to discuss this uh, case a it, little bit more. Mm -hmm. It's it's an interesting situation because uh, I can understand when the patient has some typical situation or some attacks. Maybe in some cases it looks like histrionic, but actually in this in this case the patient still um, in conscience patient can remember patient can or maybe not everything can remember but just part of the of the information but right now she told me that she doesn't remember she doesn't remember and her husband was really uh, probably worried about her state worried yes too much even he uh, he sent me and uh, even he he was asking about uh, calling to ambulance mm -hmm. so let's open it up to the audience irina uh, yeah. who wants to either uh, give a report or what they what they think or what they would like to ask as clarifying questions to ekaterina yes, i i see antonina uh, you're raising your hand you want to 
Uh, yeah, good evening. I just wanted to ask oh, about hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, neurological and uh, maybe status. Was she consulted by a neurologist before, or maybe do you have a possibility to do electroencephalography or MRI, or was it done maybe in a years or something like that? Because uh, maybe I have not heard or I just missed this information. Uh, Antonia, where are you calling from? Just say what location you're from. I am from Ukraine, from the Western Ukraine, from Ivana from Kivsk. I'm also a psychiatrist. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Hello, Antonina. It's, it's, it's nice to meet you here. Uh, actually, uh, everything is clear. She was examined by a neurologist and she, uh, she had EEG, but everything is clear. Okay, Ulrike, I saw you nod. Maybe you have a, a question to Ekaterina? Basically, I have the same question for the electroencephalogram, but it has now been cleared, yeah. Okay. Maybe I, I have a suggestion, but I guess you, you have a lot of difficulties to get access to medication, right, at the moment. Um, for, for dissociative attacks, it is always worth to try partial opioid antagonists like naltrexone, but maybe this is not a good suggestion here because you don't have access at the moment, right? Oh, uh, thank you very much for your comment. And uh, I memorized right now that she told me that uh, uh, she uh, she gets some uh, some type of narcotic. And she had such experience. And Classes this everywhere. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. This uh, this type of experience with uh, such type of drug was successful for her. So it yeah. means but that not, it might be a dissociative uh, attack. Actually, as for me, I think so, yes. Okay. I saw a hand of Olena. Yeah, ch chime in, Olena. I would also recommend to make uh, a diary of such attacks and uh, the duration of these attacks are very important and uh, in which situations had uh, has uh, she had these attacks, uh, which triggers and so on. Just Olena, where are you calling from? We just want to know what part of Ukraine you are in. Uh, originally, I'm from Lugansk. Uh, since 2007 to 2014, I have been working with Irina in Kyiv, and now I'm in Germany. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ekaterina, you wanted to comment? She used Tramadol. She used tramadol. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Maybe I add when you use tramadol, you should not use in parallel naltrexone because it's a partial opioid antagonist. Mm -hmm. Either you use an opioid or a partial antagonist. And usually opioids like tramadol can induce dissociation. Sorry, Eric, I have not raised no, my ahead. hand. It was just go an the, emotional go ahead, attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 because this may, I don't know, she she takes tramadol for sure for distinct and severe pain and reasons, but maybe it would be worth reducing, trying to reduce tramadol and, and re-evaluate the dissociative states. Mm -hmm. Can be also a withdrawal symptoms from clonazepam or tramadol because a lot of people react with seizures uh, on withdrawal from alcohol, benzodiazepines. Yeah, yeah, I, I have such idea, but uh, this situation, it's not, it's not new situation. So she gets such seizures or such attacks before, but right now it becomes worse because of maybe also increasing of clonazepam, decreasing, sorry. Uh, Victor, is there any any comment from your end when you saw the video clip how you could um, 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 clarify what you saw on the video clip from your sleep experience? I mean the EMDR link. No, no, I, uh, no, not the EMDR it. link, but the eye movement that was was slow mm -hmm. wave. No, it wasn't even a wave, perhaps, but it was sort of going from left to right, and we saw some oscillations. Yeah, that was, that was definitely interesting. But uh, um, my question was actually to to you, Eric. Like, how, how would you assess this uh, such a dissociative uh, state in a way? And does it have something to do with 
dissociative, like peri-traumatic dissociative experiences? Well, it could, could very well be. I relate to what Ulrike said about this and the amnesic spells uh, that are co-occurring uh, co at the same time. Uh, but we don't, we, we don't know too much of this and how this could be incentivized by the loss of her home, which pre pre precipitated some of these, uh, these, these experiences, as I heard from Ekaterina, right? Yes. Okay, well, we cannot solve the case, but we have some suggestions. And I think Ulrike gave an excellent suggestion from a pharmacotherapeutical perspective that you could explore in seeing what the response would be at the level of the, or the of, hear me, uh, the patient. But let's open the floor from others because the more people we have on the table, the more wisdom there is to share. So if others uh, would like to express their opinions uh, or ideas, please go ahead because this is also a, a collaborative um, exercise. Uh, Antonio, maybe, if you wish to contribute or say where you're from or your ideas. Yes, go ahead. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Yes, there you are. Oh. Um, hello, I'm Antonio. I'm a psychiatrist uh, from uh, Switzerland uh, in Lausanne. And uh, I was just asking uh, if uh, um, in sleep disorder that uh, could be related uh, of the state of the patient and uh, if polysomnography could be uh, something that could complete about uh, the diagnosis. Uh, I've been recently in a sleep uh, disorder uh, conference and uh, uh, some rare case of parasomnia, which were very related to trauma uh, background, uh, uh, were not found on EEG, but more on uh, polysomnogra uh, polysomnography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great question. Ekaterina, would you, would you, I see you comment on this? Thank uh, you. It's, 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 Thank you for your question, Antonio. Yeah, I think it's a nice idea, but I think the war will finish and it could be possible because mm -hmm. she, she doesn't have such experience. Just EEG and neurological examination and MRI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, you, but could, you could maybe ask if she has some uh, unusual experiences during sleep because Antonio, it's a very, uh, very good suggestion. Of course, now the circumstances are such that you cannot do it, but uh, uh, there's a, a lot, some overlap between dissociation, uh, parasomnias, and other unusual events, also typically REM intrusions that you might have. Uh, yeah, that, that would be very, very interesting to, uh, to find out. Can I, yes. ask, can, can I ask you a question? And it's not a closing question necessarily per se, but in your introduction, Ekaterina, you also said something about the current situation in Kharkov. And from a psychiatric perspective, you can sort of guess that trauma traumatic stress or war can aggravate all the pre-existing conditions. Yes. You see something about psychosis, you see a lot of reactive psychosis, and one could speculate that superimposing stress and uncertainty and unsafety on top of an dysregulated person, so to speak, could aggravate a lot of uh, symptoms. Is that sort of what you, would recognize or see as well? Uh, uh, right now, me and my colleagues, we don't have such experience with, with aggravation. Uh, aggravation, I mean augmentation of the symptomatology. That's what I mean. Aggravation ah. is, is more, I mean, what I mean okay. to say is that it gets worse. Like exacerbation. Exacerbation, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, so today, uh, maybe, uh, it's, it was uh, 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. Uh, I was talking to my colleague. Uh, she is the head of the admission department in a mental hospital. And she told me that uh, we have uh, uh, eight or nine uh, ambulance till this time from the morning. It's, it's a big, it's a big number. So in the uh, in a time without war, we have maybe four or five per day. 
not seven, but it's, it's, it's just the beginning of the day. And most of, of the people in Kharkiv live from the city. So what does, have, it, what does it mean? What is the message that you want to convey by saying this? Uh, the message is that uh, the number of our patients with the acute states, acute emotional symptoms and ac acute psychotic state is really increased okay. right yeah. now. Yeah. Really increased. And uh, actually, even, even my friends, some friend of mine, they called me and told me that uh, we have some troubles with our friends because they are trying to find some agent, agency of Putin and because they can't sleep, because they are volunteering too much, they can't sleep. And after three or four, four days without sleeping, they're trying to find Putin agency. Just to like have a last final uh, questions, for example, like I, I, I can hear that we have several ideas. One of them is this dissociative states. And the other one is that this is withdrawal from clonazepine. And if it's a second uh, option, what would be recommendations on that? How we can like help this patient to overcome this withdrawal if she still has? If clonazepine is, if benzodiazepines are not available, the person should be uh, withdrawal in medical setting and best and, and under the control of anticonvulsive therapy. She has some, yeah, help from pregabalin probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe the last word, Ulrike, what would your suggestion be? You had you were outspoken on some uh, pharmacotherapeutic advice. Could you say something to this? Sorry, I had a concentration. Like, what was the question? <laughs> you're, you're, you, had a, you had an outspoken... Yeah, yeah, from with a an atric zone, and the, you mean this? Um, um, you mean some... My question, my question was, what if this, uh, this patient experiences withdrawal from clonazepine, and that's why she has those states? So would, or maybe it's like... Uh, yeah. So what would be recommendation to this patient? Uh, how can we uh, decrease Okay, thank you. Sorry for my concentration lack. Um, yeah, first, as I suggested, if available, I, or first I would try to reduce, try to reduce the trauma dose. And if this had happened, I would try to, to um, prescribe naltrexone if available. Second, no. if um, psychotherapy therapeutic options are available. Um, we all know that traumatic events or strong conflicts um, underlie dissociative states and therefore, yeah, if available, I would try to identify them because they, there is surely a, a thought or a feeling underlying this attack. Um, that that the patient tries to avoid unconsciously, so to say, avoids. Uh, so these are my two recommendations: one pharmacotherapeutic and one psychotherapeutic recommendation. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, and sorry again for my concentration lag. No, no, appreciate it, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, um, I'm looking at the clock, and we're about to close this session. Um, and a few remarks, closing remarks are uh, appropriate. Um, and then I would give it to you to close this session, Irina. Um, I wanna thank everybody who is present here. I cannot read all the, the names because some are in Ukrainian, but Vera is there, Roman is there, Lysia, Natalia, Olena, we heard, Anna, Antonina. So thank you for being here. And I hope that you'll be with us in every bi-weekly session. The next one that we have, we have an outspoken expert, uh, Arik Shalev from, um, from uh, Jerusalem, who will be with us. And he is very uh, um, knowledgeable on resiliency and resilience in dark, uh, the dark days. And he will be counterpart with uh, a colleague uh, from us uh, with, um, in, in Ukraine. We don't know exactly who it is. And then two weeks after that, we have another eminent expert, Emily Holmes. From, um, from Sweden with us. So st stay tuned, we'll keep you posted. And um, there's an uncertain situation how it's gonna unfold. So every time your internet connection is up, we can stay connected and um, we'll reach out to you. And if there's any question to us, reach out to Irina 
uh, and she'll relay it to us and we'll try to translate what documentation we have that you are in need of to translate that to uh, Ukrainian to distribute to within your network. 